Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Kent Mayhew, and we're going to talk about new thermodynamics, and we're going to challenge entropy in the second law. Uh, fundamentally, there are issues with the second law, and one of my favorite statements is by Einstein. And Einstein once said, there are two things that are infinite. One is the universe, and the other is human stupidity. I don't so much think of this as human stupidity, but mainly it shows that you can program a human to believe almost anything. Even, even people that are very smart for humans can be programmed. Okay, so let's take a look. The basics of thermodynamics is how work and energy interact with matter. So you can imagine an isometric box or a system into which energy enters, dq in. And that system does work onto something. Okay, a machine could be anything. One could write the following first law style equation in differential form. dq in equals dE system, change energy of system, plus the work out, dW out. Now, one is a very generic equation and it assumes 100% efficiency, okay? But it shows also that work and energy are fundamentally one and the same, okay? Now we can say the work is done by raising a mass by a height dH against Earth's gravity. Now equation one becomes a little more clear and we go dQ in equals dE system plus mg dH, okay? And mg dH is the work to raise a mass, okay? Now this is equation two. It still assumes 100% efficiency, okay? As the mass rises, its potential energy, importantly, this potential energy can be harnessed by tying a rope onto the mass and letting the mass fall, in which case the rope can pull on another object and do work under the other object. Or one could simply let the mass fall, in which case its potential energy is converted into kinetic energy, right? But instead of being nondescript, as equation one and two were, consider that the system doing work is an expanding system on Earth's surface, okay? So the expanding system is surrounded by Earth's atmosphere, hence one would write dQn equals dE system plus the work term, and the work term is PdV atmosphere plus mg dH. Why is PdV atmosphere added to the work term? It represents the isobaric work required to lift the weight of the overlying atmosphere. You got to remember the atmosphere has weight, that being mass in a gravitational field. So any system that expands has to lift that weight. It doesn't matter what direction it expands, but it has to lift the weight upwards. Okay. If one removes the mass from on top of the expanding system, then m equals zero and equation three simplifies into equation four. Right? So, but you still have dQn plus dE system plus the work to lift the atmosphere, PdV atmosphere. In terms of the expanding system, the work done under the surrounding atmosphere is lost work. So we can write dW lost equals PdV atmosphere. Hence, you can write equation five, which is in terms of lost work. Now, lost work is considered in thermodynamics, but not with this clarity, okay? So lost work, once more, equation six is emphasizing what lost work is. It's work done onto the atmosphere. Why is it lost work? Well, you can't recoup the energy. You cannot tie a rope onto the overlying atmospheric gas molecules. Hence, the work is lost. And any expanding system on Earth's surface becomes an irreversible process, okay? Or the expansion of any system on Earth's surface is an irreversible process. If that expanding system contracts, then the energy used to raise the overlying atmospheric gas molecules remains lost, at least in terms of the expanding system, right? And the work isn't lost because the expanding system lifted the weight of the atmosphere, increased the atmosphere's potential energy, if you prefer. So in reality, the expanded system contracts, the overlying molecules now come crashing downwards, increasing their kinetic energy. This can be viewed as heat. I mean, Kinetic energy of a gas molecule is considered heat in many ways, right? So you can consider this as heating of the atmosphere. It's really no different than lifting any rock. If I lift a rock up into the air, I increase its potential. If I let that rock fall or lift that mass fall, its potential energy is transformed into kinetic energy. But I never regain that energy that I exerted in lifting that mass. Even if it hits me in the head, I don't, re I don't gain it back, right? It just bounces off my nozzle. Right? So let's talk about how entropy became a blunderous, you know, it's hard for some people, but let's, let's just call it blunderous entropy right now. So reconsider the first law, equation four, for an isobaric expanding system, right? We have dQ in equals dE system plus PdV 
atmosphere, that being the work in the atmosphere. Now, Clausius coined the term entropy in the mid 19th century as something that when multiplied by temperature defines energy, right? You know, that came from a Greek term, but it doesn't really matter. One may now choose to rewrite equation four in terms of isothermal entropy change. And you put TDS equals D system plus PDV, right? Problem is equation seven lacks lucidity of having the subscripts that clarify that PDV is work done under the surrounding atmosphere. Now this is important, okay? Uh, one might naively envision equation seven as follows. TDS system equals DE system plus PDV system. In other words, equation eight is thinking of everything in terms of the system, right? So, Equation eight is nonsensible because the work done is done onto the expand, uh, the work done is not done onto the expanding system. Rather, it is done by the expanding system onto the surrounding atmosphere, as was described by four. Remember, we've lifted the weight of the atmosphere upwards, right? So writing it in equation eight in terms of the system is sort of a little iffy. I mean, you can think of it this way. I mean, the energy of the system changes DE system. Well, that includes all the microscopic energies inside the system. So PDV can't be part of the system, okay? It just can't. I mean, if all the energy in the system changes, well, then what's PDV? So let's continue with the traditional indoctrination and rewrite equation eight without the clarity of any subscripts. And you get TDS equals DE plus PDV. We find this in all sorts of textbooks, right? One can use differentials, you know, and we learned this in first and second year calculus and claim that TDS equals DST minus SDT. And we do the same thing for PDV. There's nothing wrong with that, except that we're talking, well, we're gonna see what's wrong here. So we got nine and 10 and equation 11. Now substituting 10 and 11 into nine, you get equation 12, okay? And equation 12 is the first step in obtaining the so-called free energy, such as Gibbs free energy and Helmholtz free energy. It's used all the time in chemistry and in physics and stuff like that. The issue arises, so if PDV concerns the atmosphere, why TDS is energy into the system and DE is the energy, is the expanding system's energy change, then does it make sense to substitute 10 and 11 into nine? I mean, it makes sense if you just look at it as, as written, but when you clarify what each parameter is and it's describing, it doesn't make sense, okay? If it makes sense to you, what does it all mean, right? I wanna, I wanna emphasize this. If you're not convinced about equation 12 being nonsensible or nonsense, then think of it this way. The surround, surrounding atmosphere remains isobaric, right? It's massive. You can do little things, you can change the pressure in little locales and stuff, but eventually it's gonna go back to this isobaric state, right? Thus, VDP atmosphere equals zero, which is VDP in equation 12. The implication becomes that equation 12 is nonsense. Now, I've talked about this in more detail. You might want to read my paper, you know, New Thermodynamics, Reversibility, and Free Energy. It came out in Hydraulic Journal in 2020. But I basically talk, I give another explanation for Gibbs and Helmholtz free energy in, on that paper. I mean, we can give another talk about it, but right now we're just talking generalities in thermodynamics, okay? So why use entropy? Well, entropy or Clausius entropy is a mathematical contravance. I first talked about this in 2015 in a paper in physics essays, but this sort of expands it a bit. The contravance allows for all those logarithmic functions that are vital to thermodynamics. Right? We have logarithmic functions everywhere in thermodynamics and it's necessary because things happen exponentially. That's fine. But the danger of logarithmic functions is that more than one function can be normalized to match one's experimental findings. And so there's no, you know, there's no uniqueness to an equation and an experimental findings. There's usually a series of equations that can be normalized to your experimental findings. So it's a very dangerous, dangerous, as useful as logarithmic functions are, they can be dangerous too, okay? And I talked about this too a lot when we, when we talk about probabilities of heat exchange and stuff like that, but that's for another day, okay? Fortunately, thermodynamics logarithmic functionality can be explained in other simpler terms. Okay, consider how much work is required to compress a gas. For infinitesimal compression, in terms of a gas inside the piston cylinder, the isothermal work required for compression W A to B 
it is an integral of increasing pressure change over decreasing increments, mental constant volumes. So one may choose to write it in terms of the gas inside a piston cylinder that's being compressed, right? And you can write it in terms like such as equation 14. As the gas's pressure increases, an increasing amount of infinitesimal work is required to compress the gas another incremental volume, right? And you can imagine that. So this is an example concerning why in terms of the gas inside the piston cylinder, the work can be expressed in some natural logarithmic form. Now we, but we should emphasize that equation 14 is for an isothermal process. So if I compress a gas, right, it's going to heat up. But if you do it quasi-statically, which means very slowly, then you can allow time for the heat to escape out through the walls and into the surrounding atmosphere as you compress it. So it can be an isothermal process, constant temperature process. If the piston cylinder is fully insulated, it's not an isothermal process. But again, we got where, you know, that I'll talk about that another day if given the opportunity. Okay. So instead, the point I want to drive home is now consider a gas inside a closed system expands. In terms of the gas inside the piston cylinder, the isothermal work is WB to 2A. It is again an integral, and this time one contemplates it. Contemplates it in terms of incremental pressures multiplied by infinitesimal volume increases, right? Since, so we get equation 15, or equation 15 is an example of that form, right? Once again, equation 15 considers isothermal, so it's for quasi-static processes where heat can go out, you know, where heat can be exchanged from the surroundings into the, into the expanding system, okay? And it is, Equation 15 is founded upon the fact that as a gas's incremental pressure increases, the amount of work that an infinitesimal volume of gas can do decreases, okay? But one can realize that an expanding system, I mean, if you think about a system expands isothermally, right? That means that its temperature remains the same. And just because its volume goes up and its pressure goes down, its energy doesn't change because it's isothermal, right? So you can quickly see through, through equation 15 by realizing that the work done by the expanding system is onto the surrounding atmosphere, PDV atmosphere. One often chooses to express, express the work done by gas in terms of the expanding gas. This is done traditionally too often without any necessary clarification of what you're describing, right? I mean, if you can imagine, if the gas expands, it expands isothermally, its energy really hasn't changed, okay? But it's done work, okay, onto the surrounding atmosphere. Thus, one can see where the confusion lies early. Again, the work is done is always done onto the surrounding atmosphere. So I repeat, work done equals work atmosphere equals PDV atmosphere. The rate at which the expanding system can do work onto the surrounding atmosphere decreases as expanding gases pressure approaches out of the surrounding atmosphere, right? PS approaches P atmosphere. Arguably, the logarithmic equation is a rate-based equation. If you think about it, it should be rate-based and not written as 15. Importantly, if one continuously heats the expanding gas and the gas theoretically can continuously expand both isothermally and isobarically, right? So a more pragmatic understanding may be deduced by considering two systems of thermal contact, you know, thermal and physical contact, such as system A at a higher temperature and pressure than system B, right? So hotter system A can pass thermal energy onto system B, and higher pressure system A can do work on the system B, right? There's nothing magical about this. Importantly, the rate of heat transfer will decrease as the temperature of A approaches B. Hence, in terms of some constant, you can write you can write equation 16, right? DQ over DT equals a constant ln TB over TA. If, if system A was a heat bath, then TA would be considered as being some constant, right? That's fine. Similarly, the work done will decrease as PA approaches PB. Hence, in terms of some constant A, you can write equation 17, which is very similar to 16. If B was our atmosphere, then the pressure of the atmosphere would be considered as constant, okay? So the above formulas lead to two important considerations. Choosing to use entropy-based second law to explain why a system's energy degradation is a 
over complications. Certainly a system's capability to transfer thermal energy or to do work can be explained in simpler terms. And really the logarithmic functionality we saw are rate equations as shown by 16 and 17 on the top, right? So those logarithmic functionality or natural logarithmic functionality that is so often associated with entropy in thermodynamics can now be explained with superior clarity if one, <coughs> if one actually expunges the notion of entropy. That's tough, okay? Now, expunging no entropy took me a long time, okay? I, I mean, I rewrote, uh, that's the first one to actually properly describe how much energy it takes to form a bubble and people shot a laser into degasified water and they, they figured out the energy to form the bubble. And it, it was sort of one of the reasons why my first paper was published in Physics Essays in 2004. But I realized at that point that there's something wrong with thermodynamics. And it took me a number of years to realize entropy was a problem. As soon as I threw entropy out of thermodynamics, it became easy to write. A lot easier to write. I shouldn't say easy, just became a lot easier. Okay, but the implications of entropy and lost work are profound. So let's look at enthalpy here for a sec. Enthalpy change is, a, is equal to DE, which is actually a change of energy in the system, plus PDV, and that is the work done under the atmosphere. Now, equation 18, I'm sorry I didn't write it with clarity, but it joins the realm of nonsensible because the way it's written, someone might actually think it's all about the system. You know, it's not, okay? They're all about the isobaric expanding system in the case of 18, okay? Consider the enthalpy of vaporization versus enthalpy of condensation. Since enthalpy is nonsensible, then we should go back to maybe the term latent heat. And we used to use latent heat 50 years ago as a term or 40 years ago, right? But we've now used enthalpy is more acceptable. Well, now I'm challenging that, okay? Since lost work is done under the surrounding atmosphere, it only expand, it only applies to expansion. In this, in which case you might think of it as vaporization. Hence, the latent heat of condensation is no longer equal in magnitude and opposite in sign to the latent heat of vaporization. This must strike people as odd, okay? But let's consider this. So the latent heat of vaporization is still, you know, DU plus PDV, the work done under the atmosphere. Now, I'm using a different nomenclature than is generally normally used. I've used it in a few papers. But the reason why is that L to G signifies liquid to gas, and it indicates the change from the liquid to the gaseous state. L represents latent heat. Okay, and the reason I did that, like I said on the previous slide, I don't want to use enthalpy anymore. It's, it's too misleading, okay? But the latent heat of vaporization is again shown up top of, you know, equation 19. But lost work is irreversible, even for boiling water, okay? So when you boil water, you don't get PDV back, right? So the latent heat of condensation does not involve lost work. Therefore, it's really just about the changes in the bonding energy, right? And I write latent heat of vaporization gas going to a liquid, okay? The magnitude for the latent heat of vaporization is greater than the magnitude for the latent heat of condensation. And you can see that if you compare equation 19 and 20, right? So why are the mistake concerning latent heats? Well, there's a few reasons for it, but Unlike the latent heat of vaporization being readily measured in an isobaric calorimeter, the latent heat of condensation cannot be so easily measured. Now, I did read a paper in the 19th century by John, somebody, I'm sorry, I shouldn't know it, but anyways, I, it was sent to me by an acquaintance and stuff, and he, he talked about measuring the latent heat of condensation, but it never became something done in practice, and the reason is it's it's just not as easy to measure as latent heat of vaporization. I'm not even too sure how you'd do it, okay? But we also have to add on to this the illusion of reversibilities. And this is really Locksmith's paradox. I mean, he wrote this in about 1870 or the paradox, somewhere around there. And it helps, you know, Locksmith's paradox is basically you boil water, you heat something up, it expands, and then you stop heating it, and eventually it will compress back to its original state, right? But the point is, it took more money or more energy to expand the system than you get back. But you have the illusion of reversibility because you, because the system that you're heated is back at its original state. So this is really what Lockschmidt's paradox is, okay? It's paradoxical that it takes more energy for it to expand than to contract, but 
it, you come back to the same state. You can you can really visualize this as the atmosphere, just the forces of the atmosphere pushing everything back, and all the heat was allowed to escape out of the system anyway, so you wind up back in the same state. And since you can't measure the heat that you get back in as easily as it takes the heat to go out for expansion, you can understand where the problem is. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of you damned if you do and you damned if you don't, right? So anyways, which takes us to the second law. Sir Arthur Eddington is quoted as saying that the law that entropy increases, the second law of thermodynamics, hold, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. Now, Eddington was a big star guy in the 1930s and stuff like that, very well-known physicist. But the point is, he also, he also talks about anyone that challenges the second law is really in for a humil uh, life of humility. I can't, I'm sorry, I don't know the words exactly. You can look it up, but anyways. So challenging the second law is sort of supposed to be, well, you know, it's supposed to be, well, anyways, you're gonna be humiliated if you do it. But I, I just, I can't stop but challenge it. You can see where the problems are. If one abandons entropy and it's accomplished the second law, then one challenges Eddington's words. In plain in English, the currently accepted second law is too often used to explain why systems are inefficient or, or why one cannot have perpetual motion. It is often used in terms of increasing entropy. Entropy is always increasing. And that's problematic as far as I'm concerned, okay? So uh, let's, we're gonna continue this. So, this is from my fourth year text, Statistical and Thermal Physics. It was done by Frank Reef, and uh, it used to be my Bible, but then I realized where the problems are. And he talks about an equilibrium macroscape, a macro state of a system can be characterized by the quantity entropy, which has the following properties, okay? And basically 21 is the relation that uh, Clausius devised before, between entropy and heat, right? Okay, so entropy times temperature is dq, and so you get 21. But the, pro the main thing here is I want to go down to the bottom of this page. In any process in which a thermally isolated system changes from one macroscape to another, its entropy tends to increase. It sounds simple enough, right? But I, re I repeat that statement on the very top, right? And the thing is isolated system. The problem is that an expanding system on Earth's surface is not an isolated system. It's expanding, so it's lifting up our atmosphere's mass. So it's doing work under its surroundings, right? It's not isolated, right? You can imagine before when you didn't have clarity on PDV, it, this sort of would go, go over your head really easily. But as soon as you realize work is done under the surrounding atmosphere, things are not isolated. If it's not isolated, second law is not a rational law. And it isn't, okay? At least in terms of entropy. When you talk, when they talk, second law was first envisioned, it was more or less about you can't have perpetual motion, all that stuff. But, when you start explaining it in terms of entropy, it loses its rationale, okay? So second law of per perpetual motion. I mean, perpetual motion implies movement. Anything in Earth, anything in motion on Earth's surface must experience friction with the surrounding atmospheric gas molecules. We call this drag, okay? This is why a clock's pendulum requires a spring to keep going. It's also why your car requires energy to keep moving after you've Stop accelerating. You've hit your highway speed at 60 miles an hour or whatever it is, so you're no longer accelerating. But drag means that you still have to put your foot to the pedal, okay? So never forget that internal moving parts also experience friction. So in your car engine, you know, there's friction in there. That creates heat. Importantly, expanding systems that often power devices must witness lost work as the surrounding atmosphere's potential energy increases. As, in other words, as the surrounding atmosphere is lifted. So you can start seeing the second law is an overcomplication of reality. You don't have to explain this in entropy. You got very fundamental explanations, right? So, but there's more to inefficiency than this, okay? We use gases all the time for, you know, to power devices. I mean, that's the basis of the steam engine, right? Water changing into gas. The energy of a gas is often written 3 PV over 2. And it can be, you know, in equation 23, its ability to do work is PV. And you can see that all of a sudden there, there's a fundamental difference between the energy of a gas and its ability to do work. And the amount of work that an expanding gas does under the surrounding atmosphere is lost work, PDV atmosphere. Okay, now the reason that 23 and 24 exists, it's really got to do with how much flux 
a, a container of gas can have, okay? So the flux onto a wall so, to push the expansion, sort of, so only two thirds of the gas's total energy can be used. Now it's a very, the math behind the flux is fairly complicated. It's in the book uh, by Reef, Frank Reef there that I quoted earlier. Okay, and I've written about it a few times, but it really pushes me to the limit. I'm sorry, I'm, I've been a long time away from this sort of math and stuff. But anyways, you can understand that only 66.67% of a gas's energy can be used to do work. And this it has to be ingrained into your head. So if not all of a gas's energy can be do, used to do work, you start to understand why we have any inefficiencies, right? So the ste steam engine becomes so darn inefficient, right? That's something like 10%. I hear we sometimes as low as six and sometimes as high as 12. But the inefficiency of the gas to do work, 66.67%. You have lost work, PDV atmosphere. And you have dumping of the fluids. I mean, if I heat up a fluid and at the end of the cycle, I dump it in the atmosphere, then you've lost any energy in that fluid, right? So there's there's a few things that explain why, you know, we things are not efficient. And the likes of Carnot and Clausius did not realize such things. Okay, and the science has not progressed particularly well since the 19th century. I would argue that the science, uh, because we made the mistake with Clausius and his definition of entropy, the science has taken some obscure angles. Okay, and everyone sort of believed it, and it just gotten into all the complication of the simple, right? So a question for those who are not convinced about lost work. Traditional indoctrination falls to fails to clarify what exactly lost work is. The notion of it, it can be found in various texts, is not all texts, and it's certainly not very clear. Right? I've given a very, very clear explanation of why lost work exists. Right? Another way of viewing this, if you do not accept this, then ask yourself where in thermodynamics is the term that describes the energy required to lift your atmosphere? Right, and it's PDV. We see it everywhere, but it's written without clarity. Okay, unfortunately, this means that all this means that thermodynamics, as is used in all the sciences physics, chemistry, biology, cosmology, atmospheric physics, what have you must be rewritten. This may be too much for those walking around in white lab coats. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. A quote from Tol Tolstoy is one of my favorite. Quotes, even more so than the Einstein quote that I started off with. I know that most men, including those at ease with problems of the greatest complexity, can seldom accept even the simplest and most obvious truth, truth if it be such as would oblige them to admit the falsity of conclusions which they have delighted in explaining to colleagues, which they have proudly taught to others, and which they have woven thread by thread into the fabric of their lives. This is this quote about human nature, it, it applies to almost everybody, you know, politicians, scientists, it doesn't matter, right? Nobody likes to admit that they made a mistake. And this is going to be tough. But unless you can explain to me, you know, where the work done onto the atmosphere is in thermodynamics. I mean, I'm sorry, it has mass. It takes energy to lift any mass against the Earth's gravitational field. And th this is why, this is what really got me started on where the path I am on at this point. Thank you all for your time. Okay, I hope that uh, you can think about this, even if you don't fully embrace what I have to say, I'd appreciate some thought and just some realization of what all this means. In part B, we'll talk about how how, how this applies to uh, statistical physics and where the errors are in there and stuff like that. It's all going to be a simple talk like this. Thank you again.